Well, good morning, Calvary. It is so good to have you here with us this morning. Would you please stand as we prepare to worship?
You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you anywhere. There's a million reasons to trust you. Nothing to fear for you are by my side. I'll follow you anywhere. Jesus, you came to my rescue. upon that cross you redeemed what I had lost now my whole world revolving around you you're the center of my life you're the treasure you're the prize oh Last weekend, our Easter weekend, we were able to celebrate and witness 36 people who took that next step in their walk with Jesus and were baptized. 36 people across our, th our three campuses. And so this morning, as we sing this next song, we're going to celebrate those baptisms on screen. Uh, you can save your applause to the end, or you can clap after each one if you like. You can do it, whatever you want. Uh, but we're going to continue to worship and, uh, and give honor and glory to our Savior, Jesus. Let's sing this as we celebrate. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing His name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ 
And every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ be magnified together. You can go ahead and be seated. Pretty amazing things, isn't it? <clears throat> Watching people celebrating that all together. Uh, that's who we are. Do you know for uh, ever since that first Easter, there have been two sacraments that have been consistent within the Christian church, the church that belongs to Jesus. Two sacraments. One, baptism and the other communion and both of them in their own way reflect on that activity that took place because of the cross this uh, past week if you were reading along in Calvary's reading plan you would have been in Galatians 6 at some point and you would have read this verse but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Here at Calvary each week, when we come together, we take communion together as a reminder of this very thing, that Jesus died on the cross, the bread and the juice representing his body and his blood given freely for us. But it also represents for us this same activity that's happened for us, that we have been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I who lives, but Christ 
who lives in me. Would you remember this as you take uh, communion elements together here? I want to pray and then leave space for you. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus, for this incredible gift. Uh, we celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection in this moment, but we reflect especially in this moment on the cross and the extent to which he and you were willing to go that we might have life in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hey, everybody, my name is Rusty Miller. I am campus pastor here at Calvary Bellevue. So welcome to Calvary Bellevue, everybody. If you're new with us, this, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're new with us, you might not know, uh, this is a unique day for us, and uh, our lead pastor, Scott Beckenauer, is gonna talk a little bit about that uh, with you, but we are celebrating this Calvary Bellevue campus together uh, this morning, and, and so I just wanted to, uh, take a step back to last week and uh, let you know um, that we have a photo booth out in the lobby, and this time it will have a memory card in it. We're so sorry. Um, so yeah, if you took pictures on Sunday last week, uh, Easter with us, um, uh, somewhere, somehow, some way, you should remember that, but it won't be with that digital picture. It, it'll have to be another way. But today, you can step back a week and do it again. Right out in the lobby as you leave today, you'll find a photo booth and somebody out there to, to snap that picture for you. It's our way of saying we goofed and uh, also our way of saying, man, we love having you here at Calvary. So uh, thanks, thanks for grace. It's, it's one of the things we count on regularly here at Calvary. Hey, if, if you're a first-time guest with us, uh, we love having you. I guess you, you know we're real now. Uh, but we've loved having you today, praying that God just meets you where you are. And we'd like to meet you too, if you wouldn't mind stopping by the Welcome Center, also out in the lobby this morning. We've got some people there uh, with a free gift for you just to say thanks for joining us. If you're um, not ready to go out there to the Welcome Center, that's fine. You can snap a pic of the QR code on the chair in front of you, and you can accomplish that same thing that way. Um, one, of, one of the things that we're going to talk about today is the incredible way in which God is moving with our Bellevue campus and our Shadow Lake campus. And uh, we know that those things don't happen unless we're all living out uh, on mission generously. And so when you do that online, in person, or through the mail, uh, you're helping make that mission happen here at Calvary, so thank you. And we invite you, if you haven't yet begun to do so, uh, it's a pretty simple process. You can go to any one of those uh, opportunities and, and discover how you can do that. So uh, also one of the ways that we live out life generously here at Calvary is a thing we call the one for one. So turn your attention to the screens for this week's one for one offering. <music> Our mission is to live in love like Jesus. One way we do this is by generously giving back to our community in a special way. Each week, someone from Calvary nominates a person they know well who has a tangible need and does not have a church home. Then as a church, we each give one extra dollar to help them know and feel the love of Christ. We call this one for one. 
Last week, our offering went to a woman who has been homeless for the past four years and has recently been able to secure a place to live. As she moves into her new apartment, she is in need of many household items. Because of your generosity, here is what we were able to bless her with. This week's One for One was nominated through Calvary Bellevue for a young woman whose husband recently lost his three-year battle with colon cancer. They had only been married a short time and she is now left grieving his loss. Our dollars will go toward medical and funeral expenses and show her God's care through the love of others. Thank you for giving to the One for One. When we give, we are impacting the lives of others one life at a time. Well, hey, welcome, church. How are we doing today? Good. We good? Come on now. That was, that was light. How are we doing today? Good. good. Hey, I want to welcome in our Shadow Lake campus, all of you online, wherever you may be, and everybody here at the Bellevue campus. It's so good to be with you today. And, and uh, you know, I, I just want to start by saying this. Last weekend, through the Stations of the Cross experience on Thursday and Friday, and then services last Saturday and Sunday, there was just a huge effort put out by literally hundreds of uh, people who were making a difference, just uh, people who were serving and giving of their time. And uh, would you just join me? Like if those of you who served, if, I know you've heard it from people around you, but can we just tell you a huge collective thank you? Will you join me in thanking all those who helped serve? Um, just so many hours above and beyond uh, the normal. And uh, it was just such an awesome weekend. And uh, hey, uh, before we get into the word today, I wanna sh- take some time to share with you uh, just a few things. This is a big weekend for us, a big week for us. As you know, last fall, we kind of went into this vision campaign explaining uh, the, the direction that, uh, that uh, we are gonna be moving to help make room for the next generation of people to know Jesus. And as we've been doing that, as we walk into that, uh, this week... Literally, this week, the construction process is going to begin on our Bellevue South facility. So if you're here at Bellevue right now, this is the Bellevue South facility. So we're not going to be able to use this facility for about a year. Uh, This will be our last day. But the good news is the North facility here and the Shadow Lake facility uh, are are getting ready. And uh, some amazing changes have been done. So a couple things I just want to talk to you about uh, regarding that. Number one, just a reminder, next Sunday, we've uh, been pointing to this for quite a while now, April 14th, next Sunday is when the new service times begin. So in order to have room for everybody, which we will, um, we are adding new service times, and I encourage you to take a picture of that. Uh, if, if you're a picture person, also on the way out today, uh, we'll be handing out cards that just have the service times again, as we handed them out last week. But just a reminder that we start at 8.15. Where are my early risers at? <laughs> you and me, man, we're good. We're good. Uh, you know, the, the 9, 9.15 crowd, there was a lot more. But uh, we're encouraging people to, to come to the 8.15 if that can work for your schedule over the next year. But then services at 9.30.11, both at Shadow Lake and at the Bellevue campus. Uh, and then we also have renovated, and it just looks absolutely amazing, what we call the venue, which was the original worship uh, chapel or venue back in the 1970s when Calvary was just getting started. So I want to encourage you to be mindful of that. My encouragement is put this, these new times in your calendar as a recurring weekly event. Whatever service time you're going to pinpoint, just put it in and remind yourself that's what it's going to be. It's going to be great. Also today, we have said that we're doing open houses. So for all of the families and the individuals who are going to be shifting from Bellevue at this time, uh, if you have kids and you're here at the Bellevue campus, we really want to encourage you right after service, and it's open to everybody, uh, everybody's welcome to go over and check out the, uh, the new setting there. It's, it just looks incredible over there, uh, but we're ready. Go see where the kids will check in, where the kids' classrooms are going to be and all that. And then when we move back uh, to the south side here at Bellevue later on, uh, that building will again will become our Sarpy Care Center, uh, the Counseling Center, all kinds of great things that that'll be ultimately transformed formed into a little over a year from now. But um, then if you are here at the Bellevue campus and you're going to be shifting over to the Shadow Lake campus, we want to encourage you. They're doing an open house today from 12 to 1. So you can go over there, see where the kids are, and uh, be a part of that process uh, just so you know where to go next week. We want next week to be a great experience. It's going to be awesome. But there's a lot going on. Just it's going to be sweet. Okay? Good? All right, we're good to go. Well, today, if you're just joining us, uh, we have been, since last year, in this study about Jesus. 
We've looked at the person of Jesus, uh, the preaching of Jesus, the power of Jesus. And then over the last couple months, we've been looking at what is called the passion of Jesus. And so it's been a greater study called Quest 52. Today we wrap it all up. And what we've been doing is each week we're asking a question uh, that we're trying to answer. Uh, it's a question about Jesus or about life and how do we do this thing uh, and keep Jesus at the center of it all. So no matter where you're at, some of you may just last Sunday, may have been your first Sunday in church ever or first Sunday in a long time. You've come back because it may be what, what you kind of felt God calling you to through that Easter time. And uh, here we are. We're going to dive in. And here's the question we're looking at today. What do we do now? What do we do now? I know that I have asked this question many times in my life. And my guess is you have as well. Sometimes it's, it's a season of life that we ask that question. You know, maybe you're a high school kid and you're looking at the future ahead of you and like, what am I supposed to do? What do I, what do, I do now? Or, or maybe uh, you, you're, you're getting married and, or maybe you're having your first kid and you, you think, what are we gonna do now? Like, we're having a kid? Uh, and then the baby comes and you're like holding the kid and you're like, what do we do now? Like, what, what, parents know this journey. Right? You're like, what, what do we do? Uh, what are we going to do? Or maybe you're on the other end of the journey and you're becoming an empty nester. Think, what do I do now? Or what do we do now? It's gonna be so different. Or, or maybe it's the retirement season upon you. Or maybe it's, it's when the unexpected changes have happened. There was an accident or a diagnosis or the loss of a loved one. And you ask the question, what do we do now? Or maybe it's just the uncertainty of life. The uncertainty of, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do next. The job has become a dead end. Maybe the, the, the season of life you were in that was once so great, it just feels dull and lifeless now. Maybe it's with their finances. You just don't know how to dig your way out of the hole or see your way forward. What do we do now? It's a question we all ask. And I think that we all ask that question often, or we maybe uh, need to ask that question quite often of like, when it comes to my relationship with Jesus, what do I do now? Last weekend, we saw dozens of people said yes to following Jesus. And sometimes it's like right when we say yes to Jesus, we go, okay, uh, what do I do now? <laughs> what do I do now with Jesus? Or what am I supposed to do? Do I just keep going to church on Sunday every now and then? Or when I feel like it, is that, is that good enough? Or, or maybe you recommitted your life to Christ. You said, you know what? I, I was once, man, really uh, walking with him and then I really walked away and now I wanna get back on track. What, what do I do now? Or, or maybe it's that some of us, um, we, we just, in general, we just think, man, I, I know Jesus wants me to prioritize him more in my life. What do I do? How do I do that? And so today we're looking at a story um, out of the gospel of Matthew chapter 28. If you want to open your Bibles there. Uh, and, and, and I want to set the stage here, okay? I want to set the stage for this. The disciples, uh, they have just seen the miraculous. Let's go back to last weekend. Um, even if you weren't here, this is a real quick catch up, right? The, Jesus has called these disciples by his side. They've been walking with him for three years. They have seen him perform the most extraordinary of miracles. They've seen him walk on water, heal diseases, uh, provide food at the snap of his fingers. It's just absolutely incredible. He's talking about God in ways that people have never really understood God before, and it's making sense to them. And then Jesus is betrayed. He's beaten by the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders who had betrayed him, and they set him up on this false trial. The disciples, again, this is their buddy, the one that they thought was going to be king. He's now been crucified. He's dead. He's buried. Now he's resurrected, and he's come back to life, and now he is with them, and Jesus is going to help answer the question of what do we do now? What do we do next? And here's where we get there. Set up as Matthew 28, beginning in verse 16. It simply says this, then the 11 disciples, there were 12, Judas is now out of the picture. They went to Galilee. This is the region of the, what's known as the Sea of Galilee, where a lot of Jesus's ministry happened right there. And Jesus told them to go up to the mountain that Jesus had told them to go on. Now, mountains were notorious. You can look through, especially the Old Testament. There were so many significant conversations uh, that happened when God wanted to meet with his leaders. Um, and it's like, hey, go up here and meet me here. So here we see Jesus and Matthew tell his disciples to go. Now get this. It says when they saw him, they did two things. Would you say it out loud with me? Number one, they did what? They worshiped him. Let's try that audience participation again. They did what? Worshiped. They worshiped him. And number two, it says what? But some doubted. But some doubted. 
I don't know about you, but I have had plenty of seasons of my life where, you know, like you realize like, man, Jesus is so good. And the fact that he would not just live for me, but he died for me and he proved that there's new life. And he's, he, 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 the fact that he overcame death proves that I can also overcome what, what feels so dead inside of me. And Jesus says, hey, and, and the, the thought of worshiping him makes sense. I don't know how many of you, you know, if I say like, please stick with me, it may sound a little bit less than for some, but like Wayne and Garth, anybody? Like, like we're not worthy, we're not worthy. Right there, some of you have no idea what I just referenced and that's okay. Uh, but, but I mean, they, they are worshiping Jesus like, whoa, this guy's the real deal. This is God in the flesh and he's, he's overcome the grave. They're like, worship. but it says, but some doubted. And my guess is that many of us here today understand that tension. Man, I want to worship, but I also doubt. It might be a season of doubt. It might be a part of your life that causes doubt. It might be something unknown that you don't understand about the nature of God or the nature of Jesus that you doubt, but you can still be in awe of Jesus. That gives me so much, so much hope. Now, here we go. To set the stage, to be really clear on what's happening. Right In this moment, Jesus is gathering with them. Scripture says that he had been appearing to his disciples for 40 days after the resurrection. Jewish history accounts for that. The Roman history accounts for that. Um, it's, it's just absolutely fascinating. He's been appearing to the disciples. They've seen him go through everything he's just gone through. Jesus knows that he is about to ascend back to heaven to be at the right hand of God. That's gonna happen just a few pages later in the book of Acts, chapter one. Jesus knows he's not going to be with him forever, so he's looking at his 11 disciples at this moment, and he is about to answer this question, hey, what, what do we do? Jesus, we think you're pretty great, but what do we do? How do we grow with you? What, what are the things we need to do? And what Jesus is going to point them to is three actions. Oh, in this scripture, I think it reveals three actions that, that we can take in following Jesus more clearly. Number one, say this out loud with me, trust in Jesus's leadership. Say it out loud with me. Trust in Jesus's leadership. Uh, human nature is we're going to put our trust in something or someone. All of us do this. We put our trust in something or someone. I, I asked four leaders who are in their 20s right now, their mid to upper 20s. I said, hey, what does your generation believe or trust in? Uh, uh, what, what is it that, uh, what do we most often put our trust in? Or what do you think most people put their trust in? Here are their responses. I asked them to just use singular words. And, and each of these leaders said the, these were their three answers. Money, politicians, or celebrities. Many of us see that. So many of us tr put our hope and trust in money or, or 401k, as you see later on there. Man, I, you know, I, I just think if I have enough money, if I have more money, I, then I'll be good. And that's where my ultimate hope is. For some, it might be politicians. Uh, and if we get all the political things right in our world, then, then, then the world would be just right. Or for some, it's the celebrities or the athletes or their favorite teams. For some, it's their family or close friends. If I asked you, what is it you put your trust in? What is the response? I, I think for some of us, we need to understand this, that who or what we put our trust in reveals who or what is actually leading our life. For some of us, that answer might be ourselves. I'm just gonna trust myself. For some of us, it's, it's the money or the job. I'm gonna put my hope and trust in getting all this right. For some of us, it might be you know, the celebrities or the athletes or the teams. You know, there's so many things, but all of us understand leadership. All of us understand leadership. From a young age, leadership represented those who had authority over us. It may, like in the home is our first understanding of what leadership is. And we've all probably seen good leadership and bad leadership in our homes in different ways and at different times and different places. I know as a husband and father, there's times I have led very poorly. I can own that. Uh, there's times where I feel like I've led, led pretty well. Uh, for some of us, we understand teachers and school systems are often where we begin to understand leadership more. We have teachers who have authority over us or principals. Some of us had to meet principals. Any of you like me had to meet the principals quite often growing up? All right. Yeah. Some of us. All right. So um, yeah, it's like we find out those principals are pretty nice guys. If you can get past the initial issues that you're there to talk about, right? 
And uh, for some of us, it's this, this whole idea of, 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 you know, we see it in our workplaces, on ball teams, in our communities, whatever it may be, we see leadership examples and models all around us, and we see good and bad. And the, the, the issue is simply this. Jesus has got his disciples around him, and he wants them to understand that he is a trustworthy leader. And here's where it starts. Jesus says these simple words. Jesus came to them up on the mountain, right? And he said to them these simple words. How much authority? All. Jesus said all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a pretty bold statement. And Jesus isn't kind of like doing it to boast or walk around and be like, hey, man, I got all the power. He's just saying, hey, all authority is, is with me. I want you to understand that I, you can trust me to lead you because things in scripture show us this. Hebrews chapter one tells us that, that he, Jesus, he upholds the universe through the power of his word. If, if the word of God tells us that Jesus is the son of God and therefore has the authority. John 14, six tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if it's true that, as the, the, the book of Revelation says, that Jesus is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, if all these things are true about him, then can't we lead him, or allow him to lead us in our daily life with both the big things and the small things? I think many of us, when we think about the idea of Jesus leading us, we, we think of the setting we're in right now. Okay, I'll go to church uh, once in a while or Sundays that I can get there, whatever the thing is, right? Uh, or maybe every Sunday I'm gonna go and I'm gonna let Jesus lead me in this hour. But do we allow Jesus to lead us through it all? Maybe some of you have some really small things in your life right now that are really just irritating you. They're taking up mind space. They're, they're you're grating on your, your mind. And you're like, oh, this thing is just bothering me like crazy. Maybe it's that text message or the Slack message from work where somebody said something and, and, and you're trying to decipher it and you think there's a code that you need to have to crack it and you just can't get over it. Right? Uh, uh, maybe it's something in your house or with a family member. It's just something little that they do over and over and it just, it just bothers you. Does anybody, like, like for example, let, let's say that there's a family member that I have uh, in, in my life that uh, when I eat, it bothers them. <laughs> Not my wife, but like just the sound of like, <laughs> okay, how many of you are on the end where that stuff bothers you like crazy? Wow, okay, quite a few of you, right? And, and uh, how many of you are on the end of, I'm gonna eat and do what I want, okay? All right, I may have a little bit of a, you know, so, and, and again, to be clear, I'm not gonna say which family member, but it's not my wife or not my boys. <laughs> so my daughter in college right now, she used to say when she was little, Daddy, are you gonna preach about me today? Then I used to give her a heads up, and now this one I'm just hitting you with, girl. I'm gonna eat when I wanna eat. All right, so, so, but you know what I mean? Like little things where you just go, why does that irritate? And I have things where, the things that people do where I'm like, why does that bother me? It's a small thing. And sometimes though, there are really big things in life, really big things that, that are worthy of just, a, a, of an immense amount of heartache or pain that has come into our life. Things that just get to us or grind our gears, right? Where we just, they're out of our control and it's affecting us immensely. And, and then let me just ask whether it's small or big. Can we trust Jesus's leadership? What does that, what does that look like? What does it mean to just say, Jesus, I, I trust that all authority is yours. Um, I, I trust that, it, that you've got your hands upon this. Jesus, I trust that, that if it's a really big deal, you're gonna take care of it or you're gonna tell me what I need to know. And if not, I'm just gonna trust that you've got it and I probably need to let it go. You know, like, can I trust what Jesus says? One of the passages so long ago that really took root in my life uh, many years ago and I still have to work on uh, is, is the simple words of Jesus, right? He's like, hey, all authority is mine. Then he says things like this in Matthew chapter six. He says, hey, therefore do not worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about it. For tomorrow's gonna have enough worry of its own, right? And he says, each day has enough trouble of its own. Those simple words, don't worry about tomorrow, I think it's because Jesus is like, I've got it. I've got it. And so many of us, tomorrow causes such fear and such anxiety, much in part because we don't trust that he's got it. 
We work through our day with, with, with trepidation in so many ways. Well, that was my big word of the day, not even in my notes. Ooh, right? Like, there, there's times where we just go, man, I just can't get out of my head about this, that, or the other. And in love, I would propose, as I have to do to myself often, of like, it's because I'm not trusting Jesus with this thing or with this issue or with the bill that came in or with the news that just came in that's devastating or with, I, can I just trust him with it? Can I trust that what the apostle Paul discovered in, in Romans 8, he wrote, he says, and we know that in all things, God, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. So can I trust him with anything and everything that comes into my life? As followers of Jesus, we must be rooted in Jesus and trust in Jesus. When it looks like the world has fallen apart and we get consumed by watching news and headlines and all the things, which I can do just as much as anybody, we start to go, when it looks like things are just falling apart, can I trust him? When people are choosing to hate one another, or draw the lines of division, we choose to love and to unite as followers of Jesus because I trust his leadership. That's a better way than what the world is showing. When the world is drifting towards celebrating godlessness in so many different expressions, like when in our culture is celebrating godlessness, we hang on to God's word. We're gonna trust God's word because Jesus is worthy of following. So Jesus says, hey, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. Action number two, for what do we do now? Number two is this. Jesus gets to this. Live on mission with Jesus. Would you say that out loud with me? Live on mission with Jesus. So Jesus is like, all authority is mine. Then he says in, in verse 19 and 20, he said, therefore, go and do what? Make disciples. I want you to go and make disciples. And he says this, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey how much? everything I've commanded. <laughs> and I'm sure like the disciples, like I picture some of the disciples going, all right, we've walked to this mountaintop, whew, right? We've, we've caught our breath. Here comes Jesus. Jesus shows up. He's like, guys, I got all this. I'm in control. All authority is mine. And they're like, all right, what do we do? How are we going to change the world? Jesus, what's next? And Jesus is like, now you guys go and make disciples. He said, I'm going to take all the authority I have, all the authority of heaven and on earth, and I want you to go and make disciples. And I picture like Peter like, <laughs> us? <laughs> no way. <laughs> and he's looking around like the other disciples and they're looking around like, there's no way. You want us to go and change the world? And Jesus is like, yeah. Here's how we're gonna do that. I want you to go and help people follow me. And the way we do that is, he said, you're gonna go. These are Jesus' own words. Go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, that, that's not just randomly grabbing people, throwing them under the water and saying you're good, right? What, what he's saying here, right, is, is, is like when you go and show them, when you reveal to them who I am and, and, and there's these conversations that lead to this thing, I mean, that's a, that's a natural step. Like he said, for people to follow me, they need to bury the old life. I mean, we just saw a huge celebration of that this morning. They need to bury the old life and be raised up to the new life with me. Romans chapter six teaches that. That's the purpose of that baptism. Bury it and be raised into a new life. And then Jesus says, and just teach them to obey all things. And they're like, Whew. And Jesus throughout his ministry taught them so many ways and expressions for how to do that. I love what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter five, when he told them, like, here's how I want you to go into the world. He said, be, he said, be the salt and be the light, right? He said, you are the salt of the earth. He says, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, salt literally was a preservative. It added flavor. It was a good thing. Salt is necessary. It's even like we even know this from, from science, right? Like we need salt to survive. Jesus says, hey, go be salt. That's how I want you to go into the world. That's how I want you to make disciples. And then he said the words, you are the light of the world. He said, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. I mean, we know this. Light pierces darkness. And Jesus was using that as a metaphor for his disciples. He's saying, as a follower of mine, I want you to shine your light to pierce the darkness. So when you go to school or you go to the ball team or you go to hang out with your friends or you're at the, the, the water cooler at the office or, or wherever you are, Jesus is like, shine light. 
Don't fall into the trappings of the world and the talk of the world. Go and shine light. Now, keep in mind, this is why Jesus said this. He said in verse 16 of Matthew there, right after that, he said, in the same way, let your light shine before others. Why? Read this out loud with me. That they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying, you don't just go be good so people, people look at you and say, wow, that's a really good person. Man, they, they, they just live such a great example. It's not for the end purpose of looking good or be, being good is not for the end purpose of looking good. The end is what? Do you see what Jesus is saying? Look at that. That they may see you and because of the love and the grace and the light from your life, they look up to God and say, God, you're good. So many of you, that is your story. You, you thought God was against you. You, you thought God wouldn't, would have nothing to do with you. And then someone came into your life and showed you worth and value and love and grace. And they let you know that there's a second chance with God and Jesus will forgive it all. And you're like, because of their message to you, you now know and understand that God is good and he's for you. And that means like we just live differently. Who we are matters so much more than what we do. So many of us are just caught up in like man, thinking our life is about what we do, what my job is, what my title is, what my performance can look like. And what matters is who you are in the midst of wherever God puts you and places you. Be the hands and the feet of Jesus. That's what life on mission looks like. And I just can't help but to think about and dream about, like, just as the story of our church has been up to this point, like, we're a church family that filled with imperfect people coming together to shine light upon him. And as we do that one life at a time, one family at a time, one street at a time, one neighbor at a time is transformed forever because he is good. Now, listen, please know that our mission is never to force people into faith. That's not our mission. Our mission is to invite people to just follow Jesus with us. So when Jesus is giving them this great commission, this co-mission, Jesus is like, this is what I wanna do with you and in you and what I want you to do one another as my disciples. And those 11 guys are sitting there like, okay, okay. He says, now go and make disciples. How do we do that? We invite people in. And then I love where this goes. I think, what do we do now? What do I do with Jesus? What do we do with the story of Jesus? We trust in his leadership, number one. Number two, right? We live on mission with him. And the third action we see in this really short teaching is this. Just enjoy the presence of Jesus. Enjoy the presence of Jesus. Right at the end of the, the directive, Jesus is like, all right, guys, here's the plan to change the world. You guys go. All right, you go. Do all this. And then he says these simple words. And surely... I am with you always to the very end of the age. How long is he going to be with us? Say it, to the very end of the age. To the very end of the age. Look, Jesus knows something those disciples in front of him did not know at that time. As they're sitting there on the mountaintop and Jesus is saying this and they're soaking in the view and listening to the words and Jesus is like, hey, he knows that those disciples are about to face the most difficult stretch of their lives and that they are all going to die for their faith. Each and every one of them. You can look up in history how each one of the disciples died. It was a horrible, brutal death. <laughs> now, some of us are going, um, do I have to do that? What if he calls you to it? Now, whatever it is, what we need to know is simply this. Jesus is telling them, hey, whatever you face, in this life, I'm with you. He's like, and I'm also gonna be with you forever. Have you ever seen that, you know, found that when you have a forever vision or a further vision out in your life, when you have a good picture of what that is, what you're going through in the short term does not bother you as much? When I know where I'm going or what we're trying to accomplish, right, as, as a leader, a leadership team, or in my own family, or just my own personal life, when there's a vision in front of me that I can chase, the things that are the bumps along the road come up along the way, they don't bother me as much because I know where I'm going. I know what we're trying to do and the pain is always worth it. 
The pain will always be worth the end goal. And so Jesus is telling him, hey, I'm gonna be with you always. I'm gonna be with you. Have you ever found in your life that who is with you makes all the difference? Like in the journey towards, towards the things that God has for you or just in the journey throughout life, like who is going with you through all that makes all the difference. Like do you have, like, like, like if you believe you're going somewhere and you have, a, you know, for those of us with a significant other person in our life, right? If someone is saying, you got this, I believe in you, it's going to be great, how can I help you? You're like, man, that's good. Or if they're going, man, it's not gonna be worth it. It makes all the difference. I'll never forget, it was about 15 years ago, I had uh, been struck with a wild inner ear virus. They called it a one in a million virus that I got. Yay, lucky me, right? And uh, man, it, it just, it dramatically changed my life. And um, there's a much worse things that people have gone through. But for me, it was like all of a sudden, there's a lot of things that just, I used to enjoy that I couldn't enjoy anymore. And this constant 24 hour a day, high pitch ringing that never leaves me. Um, and uh, one of the things that really affected me is like my equilibrium. And shortly after uh, kind of working through all that and just realizing this is my new life, uh, I used to, you know, a lot of activity was always fun and good. And I, uh, you know, like going on roller coasters used to be fun. And uh, we were all of a sudden at, a, uh, at the amusement park and our kids were little. And I remember uh, Mike Lane took the, the younger two kids because they couldn't do some of the rides. But our oldest uh, at the time, uh, Josiah, he wanted to go on this, this roller coaster. And I, like, literally, I'm, you can't tell, but I'm literally sweating talking about it just because like just the thought of a roller coaster makes me sweat now because uh, it just messes me up so bad. And I remember going like, okay, I'll take him on some rides and this will be great. And, uh, and then like he can just do them. And, uh, and I get there and, and, uh, and I was like, hey, I said, that's a big roller coaster. He's like, yeah. I said, are you scared? He goes, yeah. And that, part of me was like, good. Then we don't have to go on it. You know, is what I was going through in my head. But all of a sudden, like, you know, as a father, like one of the best things I can do is, are you scared? Yeah, then let's go. Let's do it. Um, but, but I knew that what the cost was gonna be. And I said, you're, you're scared? He said, yeah. And I, he said, but dad, if you're with me, I know it'll be okay. And I've never forgotten that moment where I was like, all right, let's go. And I'm telling you, I was, messed, I was done for the day after that. I couldn't walk straight. People probably thought I had too many grapefruit, grape slushies or whatever that day or whatever, you know, but I mean, I was just, I was messed up. It was just profuse sweating because everything was just spinning and dizzy and it was just overwhelming. But there's so many times in life where I just want to look at the people around me and go, hey, if, if you're with me or I'm with you, it's going to be okay, right? When we walked in the doors this morning of church, uh, one of our senior saints uh, was kind of waiting by the door and, and she asked me the question about all these changes coming up for our church family. And uh, she said, she said, boy, this could be a lot. Do you think it's going to be okay? And I looked at her. I said, it's going to be awesome. And she's like, oh, I said, do you know why? She said, why? I said, because we're going to make it awesome. It's going to be great. Yes, we're all changing things and there's, there's new service times and we're gonna be in different spaces for so many of us and some of us are moving from Shadow Lake or you know, from, from the Bellevue campus to the Shadow Lake campus. Some of us are going you know, from the Bellevue South campus to the venue, some from the Bellevue North to the venue. Some of you have, it's your first day here and you're like, what are you talking about? Don't worry about it, it's fine. Just come back next week. We're gonna be in the North building, in the South, 8, 15, 9, uh, 9.30 and 11 are gonna be our service times. It's gonna be incredible because we're gonna do this together. And I know if you're with me, it'll be okay. And know that I'm gonna be with you. It's gonna be okay. We're gonna go through this and there's nothing to worry about. So what do you do in your personal life? How today can you decide to trust in Jesus' leadership more? How can you live on mission with Jesus more? How can you learn to just enjoy the presence of Jesus through whatever life is taking you through and to remember his promise of, I will be with you always. How do we do that as a church family? Hey, this is an incredible season for us to step up instead of step back. So many of us, maybe change brings about this desire to step back instead of stepping forward. For some of us, it's, it's that you know, we, need to, we need to be patient with one another, patient with change. How many of you love change? Like you, could, you just love it when big things change. Come on, where are you at? Where's my people? How many of you feel like you're kind of indifferent to change? 
How many of you just hate change? Okay. So we're going to need to be patient with one another, realizing that it's going to be okay. We, we need to also do this. We need to put people, the mission, in front of our own preference. Uh, I, 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 I just want to say this in love. Um, you know, we ask people in worship services to move up and move in. When you're here and comfortable, move up and move in. Why? Because guests love the aisles and the back rows so they can run if it gets weird. It's just true. All right? And, and, and people are going to sit in different seats. And I just want to remind you, nobody has assigned seating at church. Nobody. So don't act like it's your chair or your row or your seats. Belongs to Jesus. Okay? So learn to sit somewhere different. And it'll be good for you. Like, it's okay. All right? I also understand we're creatures of habit. So let's just form some new habits. Do some things. Even with parking. We don't have assigned parking. Matter of fact, the people who have been with us the longest, we say, please take the worst and furthest away parking spots. Literally. Because there are people who have no idea who Jesus is. And they're at the end of their rope. And sometimes like just removing the simple barrier of where to park and where to sit makes all the difference. It's clear, it's visible. We can help each other in that way. Through it all, we just need to remember why we're doing this. Why some of us need to move to 8.15 or move to 11 o'clock service or do whatever because 9.30 will be crazy full. It's just the way things are. But we're doing this to make a difference so that the next one of our friends, our family members, our neighbors, our coworkers can know Jesus with us. Hey, as a church, I'm so excited that I don't have to do this alone. I would never want to do this alone. We have such an incredible staff team as well as elder leadership team. At this time, I'd love to invite out our chairman of the elders right now. His name is Scott Wellman. So if you would, I think he's here. There he is. Okay, yeah. I had a quick moment. I just wanted to keep you in suspense for a minute. Yeah, that was suspenseful, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Scott has been serving on our elder team for basically the last almost six years now. And he's been the chairman the last two years. And I can't tell you how much our elder team here prays and dreams, um, how, uh, and I don't say, I'm not just saying this because he's here right now, but that's why I've stayed at one church so long is because they, uh, this elder team is filled with sincere uh, faith and a, a humble heart to seek Jesus, but they're not afraid to take courageous steps. And so anyway, um, definitely thankful for Scott and the team through this season. And I ask Scott to come out and share anything he wants to share and then, then close us with a prayer. All right, well, um, if you've been around Calvary very long, you know that Scott often goes off notes in his sermons, and that can take us to some interesting places. Um, so I thought today I might go off note just a little bit. Okay. Um, I, too, uh, think about the amount of prayer and um, the amount of time that we spent talking about, discussing, chasing God's vision for what was next for Calvary. So this is such an exciting day for us. We're getting ready to step into and follow his lead into something new um, and something that's going to be wonderful once we come out on the other side. And so we're really looking forward to that and excited about that. Um, but another point I wanted to share, um, change often makes us uncomfortable. And we all like our comfort, don't we? Yeah. Amen. At least a few of you acknowledge that. Um, it's a tough crowd. So, you know, we're going to be doing some things a little bit differently than what we've done as we enter this season. So I've been praying, and I hope you'll join me in praying, that God would give us an extra measure of his grace to cover us during this time. Um, it's an exciting time, and we know good things that God is going to do from this. And so uh, really looking forward to it. Let me lead us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, as we step out in faith and follow your leadership, Lord, uh, I just want to thank you for Calvary Christian Church. I want to thank you that you've given this body a heart for mission, a heart to bring those who don't know you yet to know you in a very personal and real way. Um, Lord, thank you for the individuals, the couples, the families um, that are going over to our Shadow Lake campus. Um, thank you for that sacrifice they're making. Thank you for the sacrifice that we're all making, Lord, 
in order to make more room. Um, God, we know you are good, and we know that you will walk with us through this. And so, Lord, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. And I want to ask for your hand of blessing to be on us. Thank you again, Lord, for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Scott. Hey, um, next Sunday, we're starting a brand new series called Construction Zone. Ready for it? <laughs> Construction Zone. A little wordplay there, but uh, we're going to be talking about rebuilding a deconstructed faith. And so you may know somebody in your life who has just kind of been tearing down their faith. They're not sure um, where or how to follow Jesus or if they even want to. Uh, this four-week series is gonna be an incredible chance to start that journey with a friend that they trust. So I wanna encourage you to invite somebody to that. If you're a guest today, first-time guest, or been coming for a while and you've never stopped by our Welcome Center, we'd love to have you stop by, whether it's at Shadow Lake or here at Bellevue. Uh, grab a gift that we have for you and uh, just kind of start your journey with us. And then lastly, just wanna remind you, the Shadow Lake campus will be open uh, from 12 to 1 today, and the Bellevue campus, some of you have already been in there, I know, and those of you who are here today, especially if you have kids, please head over, check out where the check-in stations are going to be, uh, where the kids' classrooms are going to be, and then anybody and everybody's welcome to come over. We'd love to see you then, and uh, next Sunday is going to be awesome, all right? Amen? Because yeah. we're going to make it awesome. Let's be great. We'll see you next Sunday.